So today I'm speaking to Jonathan Small. Um, Jonathan is one of the first users of MLS laser in the UK. He purchased his laser as the first podiatrist in the UK before I purchased mine as well. So he was ahead of the game. In fact, Jonathan is to blame for where I am now. <laughs> I got my laser on the back of a post that you put in a Facebook group about the results that you were getting. And I went, I need to know more about that. Um, so Jonathan is also well known for his chat around business and how to monetize your business, how to charge appropriately for your services. And in speaking to lots of healthcare um, pro provision, uh, providers or clinicians, I know that the business side of things is something that people get really stuck with. Um, so we're going to do, we're going to have a quick chat today around the business side of things and around money, which is quite often an uncomfortable subject, but I know one that you're okay with, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely fine. Yeah, no um, problem. Perfect. So one of the first things that we would like to know is what are you thinking about when you're setting your prices or arranging your fee structures? What's important to you when you're doing that? What's your thought process? OK, so so first of all, I, I when I'm when I'm looking at any, any fees, I'm going to do a comparable, not comparable with other providers, other podiatrists or other physios. I'm going to do comparable for how uh, the value that it is to solve the problem for the patient and where else they may go to get that problem solved. So, for instance, they may end up at a private hospital seeing a surgeon. And, um, and, and as long as I'm achieving the, as good outcomes as the surgeon or better, then that's where I do my comparable, because that's what the value is to the patient, because that's what they're paying out there to see other, other providers outside of allied health professionals. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that immediately raises the bar on fees immediately when I start to look at that. Because I'm not dealing the tens of pounds, then I'm dealing the hundreds of pounds, which is which is appropriate for for private healthcare. Um, I, I think it's one of the the biggest issues in, with the NHS is that we don't get told how much it actually costs us to be seen on the NHS. And I do believe that if everybody had an invoice at the end of their care with the NHS, okay, it can be zeroed invoice, but if they saw how much it was, then they'd understand that actually private healthcare does have a cost associated with it. And people will spend money on lots of things. They'll spend it on, you know, on their cars, on their houses, on their holidays, on their beauty, on their teeth. Um, but to get them to spend on their, on their uh, health needs, is um uh, can be a, it can be challenging at times um and yeah. so it's about about communicating to patients about the value of that investment in their health it's not an expense it's an investment because because particularly as a podiatrist um i go on the basis that you know if they haven't got comfortable feet then they can't do the activities that they enjoy doing they can't play the sport they can't play with the grandkids or the children they can't work in, in comfort all of these things can have a, a massive impact therefore to solve those problems has real value for the patients yeah so yeah. so so that's probably where i come at first of all is not following the norm of my profession but following the norm of private health care um and and that that also leads into other professional fees as well. So what's the hourly rate of a solicitor or an accountant? Because um, they are professional fees um, and, uh, and making sure that, that my fees are reflective of that professional status um, in, in the same way, as opposed to what seems to be a race to the bottom with, with a lot of allied health professionals. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that does anybody any favours, not least the patients. It does the patients no favours. Because when you're in the field of low, low fees, you can't invest in, um, in your skills, knowledge, time and equipment to help those patients. Yeah. OK. All good points. So I know even th everything you, that you said, you know, giving value to patients and making sure that you can invest in your clinic so they're getting the best possible treatment. But I know that the counter argument to that will be that I don't want it doesn't feel good. You know, I don't feel good about charging high fees for patients. You know, I want to make this accessible and affordable for everybody. So how do you kind of counteract that and how do you manage to feel OK with charging what some people would perceive as to be really expensive um, prices for your treatments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, you'll always be unaffordable to somebody. 
there will always be somebody who can't afford your fees, no matter how low those fees are, unless they're free. OK, so in order to have a, uh, a business that, that survives and thrives in order to service patients, you've got to set your fees in a, a reasonable level that also allows time for you to look after yourself. So that isn't being rammed six days a week every minute of every hour, um, full with patients, um, not taking any time, you know, no breaks, not being fully booked up for three months ahead so you can't see any gaps. All of that doesn't, doesn't do you any favors, doesn't look after your health. So you've got to price it accordingly um, so that it's a successful business model whilst protecting yourself. And, and bear in mind that you not only are you um, the, the therapist in the business very often, you're the person running the business as well. And, and that takes time and needs a, a cost associated with it um, to justify it, um, to make sure that it, it, it can work going forwards. Then, then you've got the fact that if you give patients the choice, it's their choice whether they spend the money. They'll spend their money on something um, and it's their choice whether they spend it on you or, or not. Um, you don't have to be deciding for them. Um, so, so one of the things that, um, that I do with, with feet is I try and fix their feet, get them as good as I can get them so they're um, as comfortable as possible. That can often work out a lot cheaper than them having ongoing regular care. Um, and so it's actually a cost effective service for them. Or, for instance, they may not need uh, bespoke orthotics, which are costly, and they may be able to get away with um, some rehab and, uh, and a laser treatment. And then they're not on a lifetime of uh, orthotics, maybe. Um, so, so there's all, all sorts of ways that you can think that actually you're still providing a very good caring service for patients. But the biggest motivator for me is the, the fact that if you're charging high fees, you've got to create good results. You've got you, you're not going to do it with not getting good results. So if you're if you're able to get good results, then charge your worth for that. Um, patients will prioritise if it's important for them to get those good results. Then they'll um, uh, they'll they'll prioritise in their spending. A uh, little hint I um, I came across uh, a while ago that I I thought was really good was out of three things: good, cheap, and quick. In business, you can't have all three as a customer. You can only have two, and it's your choice which you have. Yeah, I like that. That's a good one. <laughs> That's yeah. a good one. <laughs> so to swing it around, kind of back to laser again, um, and issues that I hear regularly from the people that I speak to. One of the things that people really struggle with as well is how to structure their pricing model. Like how yeah. best can I price this to make it, you know, appeal to patients, feel manageable for patients, but also that you're actually making money from your device. So how do you do that? And what are your considerations? And if you want to share some of your own fees, then go ahead and do that yeah. as well. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Um, so I, um, I come at my clinic from going to fairness for patients. So that if somebody's not having a service, they shouldn't be contributing to the cost of that service. And that's the problem that I have with any flat rate fee structure or incorporated fee structure. Um, that, that somebody who comes in who doesn't have laser, paying the same price as somebody who does have laser, there's an inherent unfairness in that for me. Uh, and, I, and I can't rectify that in my head. I can't, I can't solve that one. Therefore, I have to separate it out. And I know not everybody does, but I do. And I separate it out and I give patients the choice. And I say, we can treat it without laser or we can treat it with laser. Most often, what the approach I take is actually, well, we'll start without the laser um, if, you, if you're happy to do so and see how quickly you start to recover. If that is going as fast as you're happy with, then that's fine. If you want it speeded up in some way, or if I'm struggling to get help you get on that road to recovery, then we'll add on the laser therapy as a as an add-on package. And we we do in we, I break it up into packages of four treatments. We have um, uh, a block of four laser sessions for four hundred and fifty pounds plus twenty two pound fifty facilities fee per appointment. Now the facilities fee was something we introduced um, when the electricity and gas prices started skyrocketing. So I didn't want patients to think that we were just putting up our fees. We were actually, we were responding to the cost of running the clinic. So we separated out and said, okay, each appointment that somebody attends has, an, uh, has a contribution towards the facilities fee. In the same way, if you went to a private hospital, you'd pay a bed, a bed rate for the night or whatever. 
so um uh, so that's why it's done that way but the uh, the, the the package for the for the actual um laser is 450 um now if they're coming uh, if they go onto a laser package and they're in the middle of a rehab program then then they generally wouldn't have another consultation fee it would be come, come along uh, and I'll, I'll just treat your rehab whilst we're doing your laser treatments yeah, yeah. yeah if they're having right. other input to their care then it'd be treated as an uh, as a separate appointment fee on top of that laser okay okay perfect perfect um okay so we know that you're good at making a return on investment to the point that you started out with the base model laser the mv25 and now you've become one of the first clinics in the uk to upgrade that to the top end of the mls laser range and you've now just invested in one of the 1000 watt peak power MES models so you've obviously seen that laser works and yeah. that you can make a return on investment and you've turned some of that back into a reinvestment to upgrade your system. So if you could give people, um, say, your top two or three tips to make a return on investment for any piece of equipment that they've invested in, what would your top tips be? Yeah, so um, I, I like Tyson's thing on this, and I'm probably guilty of not doing it as, as well as Tyson says it, is, is actually, would you be, if somebody visited your website or your social media, um, would you be convicted on the information that you've put out on there about the service that you offer? So, so um, uh, you know, if it was police investigating you. So do you talk about laser lots? Do you get lots of information out and about around um, uh, what it is, what it does? Um, how it helps patients, you get testimonials, you get reviews, um, uh, uh, do you get referrals? All of these are good ways to um, uh, to get the, a, a return on investment for, for the laser. But but generally, I, it pays for itself, uh, Kirsten. You know, it did, it, it, you get patients coming through the door that that you make progress with and you, you treat absolutely fine, um, but maybe they're going, oh, I'm getting a bit frustrated with how quick, then you offer them this as a, and, and they'll go, yeah, I'll, I'll take that, I'll, I'll give that a go. And, and from a return on investment point of view, it's never failed to pay for itself. Um, my, my first year from uh, purchasing my uh, my M fee, um, I made three times the amount that I'd uh, paid to the machine on, on the laser. Now that's the initial take up as well. That's a brand new thing. So lots of patients talking about it. Um, so so it was my most successful year with the laser. But since then, we've been averaging about ten thousand pounds a year um, from laser treatments. So it wasn't too difficult to justify um, upgrading to the more powerful one because, but particularly, as you know, I wanted to be able to offer more for the neuropathy side. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's very little out there that can help patients who've got painful neuropathies. Um, and laser is certainly one of those things, and I've seen that in my own, uh, with my own hands to, to help patients uh, overcome painful neuropathies. Um, so, uh, so to upgrade to the, the machine that can do that the very best, was a no brainer for me because it'll pay for itself in, in a couple of years. Um, and that's without an active marketing campaign. Now, if you start to get into campaigns for marketing, actually focused targeted marketing, then you could easily cover the costs within a year or like in that first year where I tripled it in, in, that, uh, in that one year. Yeah, and it's just remembering that you've got it because in my experience, um, speaking to other clinicians, it's all exciting when you first get it and you're talking about it lots and you're pushing it lots and it's right at the front of your mind. But then as time goes on, if you don't kind of continue with that conscious thought and go, oh, I can use laser for this or I've got this piece of equipment and think outside of the box as well, because, you know, you get used to treating a certain few conditions, you know, plantar fasciitis, tenditis, laser. But then you maybe get an, an older patient in who's got arthritis in their hands and you don't think, oh, I can use laser for that. You know, so it's, I think just keeping at the front of your mind, you've got this piece of equipment in your clinic, whether we're speaking about laser or shockwave yeah. or whatever. But remember that you've got that and you can pull on that and use it and then have an appropriate fee structure for that, which is essentially. Absolutely. And then and then the other thing as well, and, and what's a real motivator for me to um, uh, to purchase a second laser effectively, was that the value it is to me and my health as I get older and my family health, yeah? Because yeah. we use it all the time. And I know you do as well, Kirsten. I, I do. Know, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that that's worth its weight in gold without any return on investment from patients, just having something that I can use to help me and my family. Um, you know, it's, it's 
it's it's fantastic tool to 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 help us keep active and and, and mobile. We were talking about pickleball before I came on. Um, I need to I need to get back to my laser so I can treat my shoulder with, with yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I've twinged it. So so yeah, I mean it's it's definitely well worth the investment, even just for personal use. Yeah, yeah. So it's all the key word, the thing that I've picked up most from our, our kind of quick chat there is investment. You know, it's putting money in to get something back. And the things that you can get back are quicker, better results for your patients, um, which is obviously really important for, for allied healthcare professionals, but also you can get your return on investment and you can make a decent amount of money from that investment as well. Because at the end of the day, we have set up private clinics as a business that pays for our bills. And one of the key things that you said there that I think we're really good at forgetting as well is that we just think about get, getting paid for the time that we're in the clinic with our patients. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about getting paid for, you know, we go, oh, I only work four days a week. And we're off on a Monday because we're doing all the admin work, you know, and all the catch up with that type of thing. Like you need to get paid for that as well. And your fees should be set to cover that as well as the, 30 minutes or whatever that you're in with your patient. Absolutely. And it's actually got even worse since COVID because everybody does CPD in the evenings now. So they yeah. look more of their time to work than they ever realized before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and and it, it all has a value to you. And 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 you've got you've got to appreciate that and appreciate yourself. Um, and, and make sure you get the rewards that you want. And, and the more, more that you charge appropriately, the better your service will become, the more you can invest, the better, therefore, the patients are, and the, uh, the happier the patients, and that will generate even more referrals because you'll get recommended. And that's obviously a biggie for me is getting that recommendation because nowhere else offers this, the treatments that I can offer to patients. Yeah. Perfect. That seems like a really good place to wrap it up, Jonathan. So thanks as always for your advice and your expertise. I'm sure that you're, you know, that if there'd be a number of people that hear this and it's like a little light bulb moment for them. So thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. And if they want to listen to any of these talks about charging, then the Podiatry Legends podcast, if they just search my name, is a good place to go. There's a lot of information on there to help them. Brilliant. Expand on the information that we've spoken about today on yeah. there. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kirsten.